And welcome all. Thank you for your time and thank you for coming to this committee meeting. Um, so we'll get going with a review of where this committee got to. And so I shall pass over to my wonderful colleague at the Natural History Museum, Sue. Hi. Yes. Well, there's been a little hiatus on things with um, COVID, but when we last got together, we um, Deb was Deb Trock was looking to be um, she was president elect then, and so the discussion was about the strategy because the strategy that we currently have is now. Um, it's now finished, I think it was to 2019, I think. And yeah. so the discussion was we really need to sort of either update that or look at what, um, do we need to rewrite it completely or do we just um, add to it? So there, there were some great plans for um, a handful of people to meet up. Um, I think it was going to be San Francisco um but that didn't happen for various reasons um because deb deb's position changed and then it sort of um all went a bit quiet and then last year obviously due to covid um we didn't get together and so that's kind of where we are really we need to look and look at and review where we're at with spinach and the um strategy i was involved um many years ago i think it was Chris Norris was the president-elect then when um, the strategy that is in place now, although it's um, um, run out, if you like, um, Chris Norris got, I think it was all of the chairs of um, each committee and a few others together in, at the Peabody in Yale. Um, for two or three day sort of meeting to sort of come up with ideas and to see how we might um, put the strategy together. Then he went off and wrote the strategy as it stands. So um, I was sort of quite new at the time and I was just um, being brought in as um, the international because that was the first time international committee was uh, put together. But um, that's where that strategy came from and it was basically probably about 15 people. Barbara, you, I think you were probably there, weren't you? I, I, I wasn't there. Um, I know it began with a survey that Rich Rabbler um, and some others held. And then um, based on that, then they got together and, and wrote the plan. I, I wanna say that whole thing started in 2009. Maybe Laura knows more. You were probably part of that, right? I think yeah. it was 2008. Um, but, uh, but we sent the, um, some of the information um, that I was aware of from some previous converse, uh, communications were sent on to Julian um, recently. So um, they were kind of from Deb track, um, you know, kind of just moving forward pre-pandemic and it was what I knew. So um, what, what we did, what um, was tradition for the, I guess, for the president elect to do um, was each year to kind of make some updates to it. So to update the plan on what had been accomplished. And that's, you know, um, it seems to me in, in going through it, because I guess I did this and then handed it off to Deb. I don't know, I don't know that it's been touched since then. But anyway, it is in the spinach folder um, that, uh, you know, a, a lot of what we had uh, set forth in that plan was achieved. Mm -hmm which is really why the idea was we need a new plan. We've done most of it. We didn't make as much progress on the international outreach, I guess, as we probably hoped we would. We also didn't make as much progress in the area of setting up training courses. I mean, we made some, but it seems to me, and I, again, I haven't looked at it now in more than a year, that those were the areas where, um, that you know, beyond that, we had mostly done everything but it's definitely time for a new plan. And we had it in the budget. We had a meeting in the budget. Um, and then, you know, because of, because of Deb's um, change in circumstance and because of the pandemic, the whole thing was put on hold. I will say just um, that, you know, I was part of the uh, National Academies uh, report team and there's there's definitely a um, 
an opening for spinach to, to do more. They kind of call on professional societies to take more and a more active role in things like um, uh, suggesting best practices for workforce training, how to keep a data literate workforce going forward, um, standards, collection standards for different, for different groups of organisms. Um, there's, there was a strong feeling in that committee, which I think probably comes through in the reports, that, that um, the, the professional societies that relate to collections matters should take a, a larger role. In many ways, spinach is the prime one to do that. We touch all those other communities. And so, um, and now, just throwing this idea out there, you know, now with this new LEAPS program, NSF has a program, L-E-A-P-S, I used to know the code, but anyway, it allows professional societies to apply for funds to do things like surveys and other activities that will, basically it's a lot of it has to do with broadening inclusion, but it also has to do with, an, with training the workforce. They, they just had a deadline, their first deadline in, um, I guess this month, just a few weeks ago, and we didn't get in on that. Uh, but what, had, what, what was happening was that societies were kind of banding together to, um, you know, to do some surveys. I mean, to, to, to do a good professional survey to, um, costs a lot of money. If you don't do it yourself, if you really do a professional, it's ten, twenty thousand dollars $20,000. So it makes sense to join together. So it, it might be separate from strategic planning. It might be part of it. But we something that for, to do for this next year would probably to look seriously for some partnerships for a LEAPS proposal. Um, I don't know that we want to take it on ourselves because, you know, all volunteer organization, we're managing an NSF grant is a lot, but, um, but we should, but it would be a way to get the kind of good data that we would want in order to, you know, figure out what our role should be. We should, it should pay a leadership role here. I think the door is open for Spinach to play a leadership role in setting standards for collections in many ways. It's just whether or not we, how we can approach it in a way that, you know, is realistic given our, all of our constraints. Uh, can you, what committee was that you said? It was a committee that was commissioned by the National Academy of Sciences, which is, that's what they do. They're an organization that basically does reports. And they brought together about, I guess there are about 15 collections professionals from, well, actually researchers, educators, collections professionals from across the US. This was commissioned by our National Science Foundation. And it was basically to um, make recommendations about the, about biological collections. So it also included living collections. It wasn't just preserved collections. And it's important because now actually the National Science Foundation has picked up on several recommendations in that report and has put them through in, the, in their bill to Congress and it's that they passed. Probably one of the most significant ones for collections for people like us is that they probably now will start to require a specimen management plan. When you submit a grant to the National Science Foundation, you're going to be required to describe what kinds of collections are going to be made, how they're going to be cared for in perpetuity, and it's going to be expected that you provide the funding for that. So that's really big. Um, and if nothing else came out of the report, you know, um, for the day-to-day -day life of a collections manager, that's probably as good as you could possibly want. All right, thanks. Maybe if I can chip in there, isn't that a larger problem that um, also some sort of tension between universities and academia and collections actually, and which could be a good opportunity to position collections better against academia. Um, so we have seen in, in different um, Nagoya meetings, um, representatives from Africa shouting really loud to the audience about the students going to UCL in London and nobody knows where the samples are. And I said, ah, I know that one. Mm -hmm. um, and we have heard exactly the same last year during that wonderful Latin America forum. Yeah. Um, there is an interesting paper, sadly in German, there was an official survey from the German Ministry of Research on collections in Germany. 
and that mm -hmm. was the devastating pictures for university and the demand for professionalism for training so these are the points that have been raised in the strategic plan earlier and i think we really can make a point here we discussed that yesterday in the best practice mm -hmm. committee the problem that we all have is a lack of time so we would need some sort of good organization not only one person that takes a lead and then gets stranded but we would need a good plan for that and it might be worth looking in opportunities and maybe just to bounce that back from the seat of side there is a similar group what a surprise they have exactly the same problem large group a lot of people no movement time constraints commitment mm -hmm. and i i think um, it is not because we don't want but I think we, we really should try to keep things focused and take advantage of opportunities, but then make it good and connect all the other committees that should be in the boat. And that is one problem that we have at the moment. There is no communication between different committees. So it's really difficult to make plans and to come up with a solution um, that could be useful in other areas for the society as such to increase the visibility. So there are a lot of points that connect there. Yeah, thanks, Dirk. That's definitely um, some of the things that we were looking to discuss or certainly open up discussions on in this meeting. So it covers quite a few points there. Oh, but just going back to that leaps thing, that's obviously, um, and bearing in mind me being European, and I still consider right. myself European despite Brexit, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> um, being European, of course, you know, won't be so familiar with the um, North American funding streams, but this yeah. is something this LEAPS program would potentially be something that would pay, give us funding to pay somebody to do this, is it? That, that is, yes, yes, that, was, that would be, that's how a lot of societies are approaching it. They're planning to use it to pay for, it's more than just a survey, you know, more than just like a Google form survey, but they actually will, will do a lot more outreach to, to members. Um, and potential members, you know, and members, people who aren't members anymore, to try to give a better picture of what the society, what, you know, how it's perceived, what more it could do, and that sort of thing. Um, I'm not sure that's the only thing that you can ask for money for, you know, there, there may be more. Um, it came up, it's only sort of came up in like February, this deadline was announced and everybody was scrambling. I'll know more, uh, or we'll all know more in a few months when we see who was funded. I happen to be president of another society, and we did kind of, it's very similar to spinach. There's no, you know, no paid member to, to kind of carry this forward. Um, we, we, we signed on and we should get some benefits from it, but we didn't have to actually do that much. So if that gets funded, you know, have a much better idea of what spin, how spinach might benefit from this. Um, so, so yeah, it, 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 it might pay for other things too that we might want to have done. It might, it might further the strategic planning in, in some other way, you know, might provide some workshops or something. I think it's actually framed as a research coordination network, which is a specific type of NSF funding, which mostly just brings people together in groups. Um, but 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 I, th I think there are many things, you know, that if we had the money to bring Spanish people together to discuss, that we could really do in an efficient, you know, we, we could make much more progress than we do right now. As Dirk says, you know, one meeting once a year and committees not talking to one another is not going to get us where we need to be. Good option would be to look to Edinburgh. It was announced in parallel as the seat of meeting at the moment. Um, there is a lot of money from the EU that goes out for the next 10 years for capacity building and training. 
So that is part of Horizon 2020. Um, Jules, um, you have a colleague directly sitting in your museum. I can email you the name. She was on the seat of meeting and it might be worth looking into that as both societies have a standing MOU. Um, some things run in parallel where a lot of people don't have time. So that is not really useful. It might be worth to strategically look into opportunities there. Um, as we are working together in other areas as well, digitization project things, um, and then really to, to come up with an idea. And I think if hopefully there is some wood to knock on, um, the conference will take place in Edinburgh next year. Um, CETAF will be there, so that would be a very good opportunity to plan ahead. We have one year time, um, but we should fill that with life. Okay, I, I fully agree with that. Um, just out of interest, is that contact Jana Horak? My place. All right, she's not communicating with me at the moment, so I'll chase that. I, I don't know what's going on with natural science at the moment. That's an aside. <laughs> I have just um, seen that, that she is there. So there are a lot of UK institutions now in CETA Effective and there, the discussions today and yesterday have been, um, so CETA has been approached by the European Commission directly to engage. Um, so, and even though the, the landscape is not finally settled yet, um, there is the reason behind is because of the upcoming post 2020 global biodiversity monitoring framework. And it is very obvious that especially the developing countries do not have the capacity. And that was something that was raised and discussed last year during the Latin America forum as well. And so from the feedback that we received from that forum, I think that would be really wonderful to look into because that's a wonderful opportunity and we shouldn't miss it. I agree. Okay, um, I'm gonna move us on a little bit. There's a couple of action points that come out of this, which I, I'm going to ask. Uh, first, Barbara, can you keep an eye on that leaps thing? I will, yes, absolutely. And it, it sounds like you're one of the best people to see how us as a society could come a part yeah. of that and maybe link in with yeah. another American society or two. I'm definitely Dirk, going to do that. The CTAF links, you're the obvious choice there. So again, can we task you formally to keep an eye on that in relation to the work of this group? We should perhaps clarify that maybe in the smaller group, how we want to bring the existing MOU to life. At the moment, it was rather stagnant. Um, that might be worth discussing in a smaller group. And then I can make direct linkage to, to Anna Casino because I know her very well. And at the moment, Michelle Price is still um, president. I think Barbara, you know her personally. Mm -hmm. So I think there would be connecting points. Right, excellent. That's quite a lot to work with, isn't it? Um, good starting block. Okay. Um, some of that's covering stuff already that we've got on this agenda, but um, I'll go look at it. So the existing action points that came out of where these, this group used to sit, or did sit, um, the starting block was to produce a survey for all members, which is always a good idea. This is where this kicked off originally, and was to repeat that survey in some form. Um, it's quite clear that other committees, and this goes back to the point about the committees working together and communicating more, are also keen to do a similar survey to understand our demographics and how we can support international members more and such for. Um, the diversity, the idea group, for example, is looking at that and I'm sure other teams are as well. So that goes back to the point about linking all our committees together in some way, because it'll make sense for the society just to do a single survey at one point. But if that can be linked in with another society in some way under this LEAPS program and we can fund somebody to, to do it, then that will make us life, our life as volunteers much easier. We also just joined the AIBS, and so I'm hoping that they can help us with the, the survey. They have some folks there. Anna Monfils is uh, our liaison with that. And then I've been hearing the same thing from committee after committee about the lack of communications and everyone wants a survey. So I think <laughs> after the, the spinach meeting sometime in July or August, we'll try to get a, a Zoom meeting with all the uh, 
not collection heads, uh, committee heads uh, together, chairs, and talk about this and decide exactly what we need in a survey rather than having you know, one super long survey or lots of little ones, uh, try to trim it down to just the basic, what, what information do we really need and uh, use that as a starting point. There's one other little matter that, that um, was kind of stymied Deb and I, and, and that is that spinach doesn't actually have a mission statement. And what we were debating is, should we, should we write a mission statement and then do the strategic plan? Or do you do the strategic plan, then do the mission statement? But we sort of thought, well, so what's the strategic plan around? So maybe you do an interim, uh, you know, your best guess at a mission statement, then you do the strategic plan, then you modify it. We never, we never got past that little hurdle. Well, everything fell apart about this time last year. So, um, but, uh, but, but, but so that's a conundrum. I don't know why spinach doesn't have a mission statement. And you know it shouldn't be that hard, but it's probably harder than I think it is. I would have thought you'd need a mission statement before you can do your strategic plan because that focuses you. Right. But it could yeah. also limit you. So you know that. <laughs> you. If you've got things come up in the strategic plan, that's what we thought. You can always change your mission statement. It's not like it's in the you know it's not like it's a big deal. So maybe like you say, you make your best guess. Yeah, <laughs> and then and then you you modify it. I don't. That seems unconventional, but maybe who cares? You know, maybe maybe start out with a preliminary mission statement. Put something down on paper that gets you focused in the right direction. Yeah, and then as you're doing your mission statement, as things develop, you can go back and modify because you're not going to put out that statement, your mission statement, until you have it set. You know, until it's set. Mm -hmm. but it can be modified as you go along. But I think putting down something first will help focus where mm -hmm. we need to go. I guess I didn't realize we didn't have a mission statement. So. Well, I, I didn't either, but I thought when we were, we actually got as far as starting to design a survey. And I thought my first question should be, you know, how's our mission statement? Then we couldn't find one. Now maybe there was one once, but it does not appear on our website. Uh, Do we have hey, a vision I statement? Maybe I can look back through the archives. I thought I saw a mission statement at some point, but way back when, when I was going through the paperwork, but I'll check and see. We also have a copy of the last survey we did and the results. Mm -hmm. Well, that would be good too. Yeah, it'd be, be good to put that somewhere available for this group. So I think um, what we'll need to do is uh, put a central Google folder together where we can put these documents to this group. Because it's got data in it, I think we'd have to be careful about um, access to that sort of information. So it probably have to be locked down to the, who who's actual committee members to this group rather than a, a, an open, an open folder would, to spinach in general. It would also be helpful for another reason. So uh, as we started to do um, official submissions that are visible on a political level, it would be very helpful um, not only for us to understand who we are, but also for the stakeholders and um, people with whom we engage, that they see who we are. And so also from that perspective, I think that would be very useful. Well, okay, great. Grace just raised an interesting point on that. Um, it, what's the difference between a vision and a mission? I don't know. <laughs> so your vision, 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 vision is a wish list. Big, big a mission is yeah. you're focused. Yeah. So uh, I'm you, just catching. I'm just catching up with catch, uh, chat a moment because Travis Professional Development Committee. Oh yeah, also interested in the survey, and just a couple of comments about that. Okay, we're having a mission statement written already. <laughs> I like this. <laughs> Working group all of a sudden, brilliant. Yeah, um, well, that's great. I think um, any starting block, and then again, we can put this on a central folder somewhere and people can start to edit and put additional uh, thoughts to it. But it does sound like 
just from this preliminary discussion, we do need some sort of mission statement. Strategy. <laughs> that looks like a book, not a mission statement. No, no. Oh. It's, it's rather slim, but they have one for development. That's usually very, very short. Um, there is an executive statement for digital sequence information. And so that, that really helps you to, to keep focused. And also if you, if you want to reach out, so there's something that you can show because it's, it's in a condensed form. So as you see there, that's not much paper. Um, I think but, we did actually put in the budget and, you know, which I assume has been carried forward with the strategic yeah. plan of pub some publication costs. Yeah. So it could be a, you know, a brochure. And especially if you engage with, with governments. And so we have that problem. Uh, we discussed that with US Fish and Wildlife. So it would be really helpful to, to show them who we are. Mm -hmm. um, and at the moment, we, we can't connect. We are a loose bunch of people <laughs> that are interested in a very good topic, <laughs> which is fine. But the, the problem is usually you're recognized on a different level there. Okay, it's obvious we need to do some work here then. And we've got some examples coming through, which is great. Um, Laura's just added about the IDIG bio workshops as well. So some of our associated, um, some of the groups we also associate with and have a lot of crossover with are already sort of looking into this. So um, yeah, if you've got anything, share it. I think that's the best starting block for this and we can, we can start to pull some ideas together. So that's an action point for this team then. Okay, we've got another one. Um, anything else? I'll try and move on a little bit because we can, we're going to run out of time. Um, but any other quick points on that before we can move on? One thing I, that always just um, comes into my head, we've talked about the people that we have MOUs with and that we are, that we are connected with, but is there any way of um, using those people and also centralising for the membership? Because I couldn't tell you who what our list of people we are um, do have MOUs with or do have um, an association with as a member. And is there an official way of, I don't know, pulling that together more um, easily, if you like? Because we, we have quite a lot of uh, groups now we're associated with. We, we have you know MOUs with a few people a year. So we, over the last sort of 10 years. So there must be quite a long list of people, of groups that we are um, affiliated with. Oh, I've no idea. Uh, and you're right, we have MOUs with a lot, but and, and there must be a list somewhere, probably not an up-to-date list. I, I and do we, do we also have arrested. sort of someone, a liaison? Do we have one person that, you know, if we wanted to find out what's going on with them, I mean, that, oh. that always just sort of, it always just sort of seems to me as though it's sort of hanging there. We have these people that we want to have an association with, but we haven't really followed up on that in a very clear manner. We do have representatives, right, to, to various groups, yeah. and they write yeah. reports for the, hmm. for the every six months. But they're not coordinated among themselves in any way, or, yeah, no. And they're not necessarily people we have MOUs with. Not necessarily, no, yeah. So I know that there is a list, other place where all of the existing MOUs are stored on the council Dropbox. So I could come up with a list of those. And if we're talking about a central repository for documents for this particular committee, I can I can uh, put copies of the MOUs there. And the, the question would be, what is the strategic goal for that corporation? So just having an MOU or to connect or are there specific points we want to do, they want to do with us? At the moment, it seems to me that there is a lot of 
connections, but not, not a clear structure how they might be useful or how they should be developed. And how we, how we might be useful to them or, you know, how we can stop doing the same thing as we always do, reinventing the wheel. So there does seem to be uh, a lack of strategy, uh, coordination between that group. We have got some really good associations, yeah. but I don't think we're using them as perhaps we could be. Well, we, it's like with Natsco, we, we now have 10, two MOUs with them, the one we signed in 2014, and they've done another one, we've done another one for the Edinburgh Conference. <laughs> really? Yeah, I know. <laughs> well, that, that sort of shows, that sort of demonstrates the fact that actually it's not working very well, because if we already have one, why do we need another one? If, we, if that connection is there, yeah, so. Well, MOUs do, do expire. They have a timeline on them, so you Did presumably they? that timeline ran out and you had to sign a new one. Okay, I, I, did, I didn't know that. I didn't know that there was a timeline. It's yeah. very yeah. relevant. Yeah. If spinach really wants to position itself as sort of the nexus of all different collection related, you know, disciplines and so forth. So like firming that up, checking it over, and then maybe trying to have a more purposeful uh, um, and active MOU program might be a great and pretty easy first step at that at a central at establishing establishing you know spinach as that as that nexus. Yeah. All right, that's another action point. It's also really helpful for finding partners for doing joint conferences. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'd like I'd like to see a copy of an MOU just to see what it's what is uh, said on it, and how we interact. I've written MOUs before, so I'm curious. Yeah, I mean, I've seen one or two of them for spinach, but are, are they all standard or are they different for every organization? I guess I they're... they're standard and they're very basic. It's basically, as Cindy says here, um, just formalizing an affiliation. It doesn't usually doesn't have anything specific in terms of deliverables or anything like that. I think some of them have a reciprocal exhibit, like booth exhibit things at conferences. So, you know, we could have taken our booth to um, a few other uh, society conferences for free. And we should have been um, doing the same thing with other societies at our conferences as well. But I've, mm -hmm. I've only briefly seen that on one MOU and that's it. I think, wow. think, think sometimes as members of Spinach, we get cheaper um, registration, excuse me, registration for other conferences as well, that sort of thing as well. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Yeah, no, I definitely remember that. We tried doing that with Nats or something. Yeah, these are two different levels, are there? The, the one sort is then rather short term, focused on a conference, while the other ones might be more strategically into a direction, if, if really there should be some sort of collaboration or mm. it might be worth sorting that out. Because as Shelley said, some of them might already have expired. And so the question would be, should they be renewed? Um, if so, for what purpose? Or well, to do some evaluation, was that MOU helpful? Did it deliver what it promised or what was envisioned? Yeah, Dirk, I'm gonna move us on from this one now because we're running out of time. But there's obviously a, uh, quite a bit of work to do there. You know, who, the whole MOU thing needs revision. So I think we'll start with Cindy's suggestion which is um, to have a quick reading of them and get a general feel of what MOUs we've got and what to structure them. And then I think we can build from that point onwards. Um, Just a quick point. I did find a general template for an MOU with spinach and whoever you want to add to it. So I can put that in the, if we put set up a Google doc uh, folder, I can put that in there. Yeah, probably have to make a drive or something for this one. So I have to look into that. Um, I'm going to move us on because we're already at quarter two and we've got the following on committee, so we do have to finish on time. So, but this is really good, good discussion, actually. It's really useful. Um, 
I just review those existing actions because a lot of what we've got on here has been overlapping really nicely and really interestingly. Um, the, the survey we mentioned about, and actually we were already going ahead with the idea of forming a, having a meeting with the various committees and stuff to sort of discuss that. Um, at the end of those existing actions was to revise the model for hosting future meetings to facilitate the growth of the site and its international membership. Um, that's probably going to come up again in conference later today. So we're we'll probably best to park that one for the moment unless you want to bring some thoughts up in AOB. But it's obviously in the post-COVID environment and on the back of two virtual main conferences for us, we're going to have to review, try and review the way we do things and to make the loading of trying to deliver the conference more manageable, I think. It, it, it's quite a big challenge. Um, but tying with that, we've got... Um, Sorry, a couple of points here, uh, which we've already touched on in some ways. Professional training as outlined in the strategic plan. And this was something Dirk outlined. So this goes a bit beyond the conference, but how do we facilitate professional training and other activities? Now, I probably haven't got time to discuss this in any depth, but Dirk, did you want to add a few lines to that? Yeah, the, the problem that we had previously is that when we wanted to offer professional training, that was part of the local organizers to arrange. And the question there would be if, if there would be options that we can offer in parallel so that spinach, the society has some, some oversight on the planning in parallel to conferences so that, for example, these trainings would be free of charge or that this is how things are organized on the CETA side. So for our Nagoya group, we received, I think, eight years ago, 10,000 euros, and we still have money left. But what we did, we paid the trainers cheap accommodation for one night or two, and then having 50 people in the room and doing the training. And that attracted usually a lot of people. And in the past, during conferences, we had the problem that the trainers should pay the fee to attend their own workshop. And I think that's simply not a good idea. <clears throat> and so the if if that is part of the strategic plan and we tried repeatedly to attract at least a tiny bit of money during the council meetings and it was always I think we tried that three times now and it was always not supported or pushed forward. And then my question is, how should we do training then? So we would lead, at least need a little bit money and we need to have a structure that we can deliver the training free of costs because that is something that makes spinach attractive because people attending a conference have to pay a lot of money and if you have no financial backing from your institution or if there are people from developing countries they're really eager to attend so that would be also something for for outreaching activities I, I would just like to say that in regard to this it's probably a topic um, that should be taken up in depth by the um, the conference committee and the, the the reason this I think falls through has fallen through the cracks is that, as you know, Spinach turns over the running of the meeting to the host organization. We do have a document that lays out our expectations, but I'm not sure there is anything much in that document about workshops and what Spinach's expectation is there. So it, it and unfortunately, I'm not gonna be able to attend the, the, um, the, the conference meeting later, but it, it's something that you could work on is figure out what is what what would the policy spinach would be to put forward to people who host our meetings in the future and lay out those expectations. Because I think even though we've had certain expectations there, they aren't necessarily being transmitted to the, the institution that's hosting the meeting. And that's where that's where that's fundamentally where things are breaking down. Yeah. yeah. Well, maybe to earmark some money. So if they are hiring a conference venue that they that we can pay the room costs. So if you want to do that in parallel, so that will be another option. Related yeah, to this, we have a um, grant proposal in review where we um, are funding trainings for natural history collections for students. And 
we would want to host those at spinach meetings. Um, so the funding in that case, I mean, it's not there yet because it's in review, but let's say the grant gets funded, you know, that would, we would be the ones providing the funding. So we, I'm, I'm thinking of spinach more as an organization to serve as an advisory board. Like I would need members of, I don't know if it's this committee or some, a group in spinach to, you know, read an annual report and provide feedback, you know, as an organization who that studies natural history collections, what seems to be the gap where the, where the program could be improved. You know, that kind of like advisory council feedback on a funded project would be something I'd be interested in that's related to these trainings if we were providing trainings and using spinach as the host organization. And that could tie in of course with international because the meeting moves around. If we, if we discuss this more, I'd like to get involved with it. Not now. I mean, I have some thoughts on, on um, bringing people in that are uh, unable to afford our spinach meetings. Um, but just to let you know, just keep me in mind. Uh, definitely, Carol and, and Travis, I think there's some really brilliant points coming out here. And there's, there's a lot of material to cover here that we're not going to be able to sort of go to depth. So. This will probably take me usefully, usefully on. Um, we've talked about committee links and the, the need to sort of bring the committees together more to communicate. So I'm not, not going to dwell on that. It's only because we're in the last 10 minutes and uh, a couple other points to cover. So it's quite clear to me that we need to get this meeting running more regularly. And so we can make progress with a lot of the things we're discussing. <laughs> Before I get there, um, any further post COVID considerations quickly for this committee? Bear in mind, some of this stuff's going to come out in the conference meeting mm. later as well. Well, just one more thing, and, and, and it's, it's hard to know what the impact of COVID is going to be on collections. But I just this past week, I, served, I, I met with Beth Merritt and a few other heads of different types of collections organizations. I was kind of wearing a spinach hat. I was more wearing a beacon hat, but it doesn't really matter. But anyway, we had decided to meet because we thought maybe we should approach the state's attorneys general in the US who are responsible for overseeing the not-for-profit status of museums um, to sort of inform them and warn them about the potential danger to museums. And this all goes back to a survey that suggested that up to one third of museums in the US might close. That was all museums, everything from, you know, AM and H down to the little house on the corner that has some old furniture in it that people go and see. Um, and it's seeming now like, um, like, yeah, like maybe the situation isn't quite as dire for museums as it, as it we thought it was going to be in the US, but still the question came to me, um, you know, well, in, in natural history collections, how do you know who's in trouble? How can you monitor? What do you do? And I mean, we react when something happens, that's basically it. And if, if there was a way that we could pay, play a more proactive role, um, then that would be a really great thing going forward because my guess is natural history collections that will be a long tail of decay. It won't be closing tomorrow because you can basically just shut the doors for a while, nothing's going to happen. So I don't think we're going to see an immediate response to COVID related stuff. I think it'll be much slower. So we have maybe time to, to do a better effort. And internationally, I, you know, it's a problem too, and we should be watching it, but it's, you know, we, we, we need to think more seriously about what we can do in this regard, I think. Barb, is there some way in which we can understand more when talking to the state's attorneys general, what might be coming in terms of funding in, in the different federal programs that the current yeah. administration is proposing and where there might be the potential? I'm thinking about things like the WPA yeah. and those kinds of things that they did before that they seem to be sort of yeah. leaning towards again. And, and would there be opportunities in there for us? Well, you know, we're trying to get a conversation with them to find out what they know about museums, what they'd like to know about museums, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and I hope they could get. And that's certainly a question we can pose. So I hope more will happen in the next month or two with that. We'll see. Right. Thanks. Thanks for that, Barbara. That's another key thing we're going to have to look at as well. Um, so that takes me neatly because we've got five minutes left of this meeting. Well, we've got less than that because we're in the changeover period now and about to go into it. So that's going to take me to the final point I'm going to um, 
discuss and that's about this committee and how we go forward from this point onwards because you know meeting one year and a few emails isn't going to do the job video conferencing has changed the whole landscape about how we can operate because here we're going from australia to wales and around the world so it's quite yeah. impressive isn't it um and so my starter for 10 is to say we meet monthly if people are up for it yeah uh, it's going to take me and Sue some time to work through these notes and these comments and to put them into it. And also, uh, yeah, <laughs> Deb puts a good point, uh, community Slack group as well. So if you're willing to stay involved and to commit to this team, more than welcome to come on board, sign the sheet at the bottom, use that initial document to put any comments and thoughts that you have additionally to this, um, to this meeting. And uh, we'll go from this point onwards, I think. And if somebody can, yeah, we'll try and set up a Slack channel as well for this group as well. Slack channel's already set up and um, many of you are already on it. So you just need to- um, <laughs> That's what I'd like, initiative. You've been, you've been in, there's a spinach um, Slack channel and then there's a LPR channel within that. And the agenda for today is already up there. And some I have invited some of you people. So you just need to say yay and- um, but we use this for um, Museum PES and it's actually quite a nice way of communicating both in the meeting, but also when you're away from the meeting because we're all at different times and just so you can keep, you know, documents going, conversations going. So it's actually quite um, an easy way to do it. So give it a go. At that, at that point, um, I will close because we have to prepare let some space for the next committee to come into place. I'd like to thank you for your time for a really good conversation and for probably giving us far too much work. <laughs> yes, thank you. But, that, but that's good. <laughs> it, is, it is a good start. It's very encouraging. Thanks, Jules. Yeah, that was good. Thank you for that. Yeah, um, we're going to have to condense it into something useful, but um, the way to do that is just to keep getting together and just having these conversations, I think, and then we can make some structure come out of all of it. There's a lot to do there, but very, as ever, the community coming together to support the community. That's, that's the beauty of these organizations.